I told you I would start off talking a bit about idolatry today. Uh, I may sprinkle it in here and there throughout the, um, the class. Idolatry, we talked about it last week. Most of us think idolatry is essentially having those some little god, some little statue. On the surface, that is what idolatry appears to be. But ultimately, idolatry is the worship of yourself. Idolatry is the worship of yourself. The reason you have those little gods, it's not because you love those little gods or you love to go and pray to them. You get to worship them any way you want. You give them what you think they want. And if essentially those little gods become just like you, you give them what you want. Uh, you don't give them what you don't want. You give when you want. Uh, you do what you want. Essentially, all idolatry is based on you getting to do what you want. That's the purpose of it. The temple down the road has temple prostitutes. Well, that would seem like a very interesting religion to you. It's, it, it's all based on what you want. Idolatry is just essentially the worship of man. It's disguised. Evil is very, very subtle. There are some other things in idolatry that we can, we can talk about. Essentially, the reason that God hates idolatry, and if we go to the Ten Commandments, which the people that were studying should have known, the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me or besides me, one of the translations says. God doesn't want anything else that you are focusing your attention on. The second commandment, don't make a graven image. Don't make an idol. Don't make uh, anything, any image of anything, whether it's on in heaven, on earth, and the sea. Don't make any idols. You see, our visual system is our most powerful system. Typically, you believe what you see. Can you be deceived by what you see? It's a big business. Illusionists make a business out of, dis out of having people say, wait a minute, I just saw the lady sawn in two. It's impossible. Oh, there she is coming out on stage. It actually is a game to us. We believe it's entertaining to have our visual system deceived because we depend on it so much. So God doesn't want any, any idols. I want to go now through... Well, before, I, before I, we get to the lesson, let's just talk in idolatry. What happens is we're supposed to be focused on God or the things of God, the things that God wants. And when something else starts attracting our attention, we turn aside. It's not that we go running after idols. It's just that you just a little diversion of your attention. I'm probably not the only one in the room that's been on the internet and you specifically went to find some piece of information. And after 30 minutes, you've been clicking on things and you can't remember why, why you came there. You can't, because one click led to another, led to another. This is a, an example of how idolatry works. It just diverts your attention. Oh, I better, I better, you know, I better know that. I better figure out why you know, what foods to eat or what, whatever the thing is that drew your attention away, something that you've got to know because you're worried if you don't know that, something bad may happen to you. 30 minutes later, you can't remember the true reason you got on to just get the piece of information. Turning aside and suddenly your 
imagination is caught up in something else. I don't know that the kingdom of evil, but Satan is so worried about you worshiping him, although he did ask Jesus to worship him. Ultimately, he would love that, but he's just satisfied if you're not worshiping God. And not worshiping God, we start by just a little bit of diversion of our attention. And we end up as Micah with his idols last week. If you would have asked him, Micah, are you, are you faithful to God? He would say, absolutely yes. And we should notice, oh, we've got some seats up here, uh, it, that you can be in uh, you can be in idolatry and not even notice it. Idolatry also produces self-righteousness. Worship, worship of God, focus on God produces righteousness, but idolatry produces self-righteousness. Actually, worshiping God in a self-righteous way can also produce self-righteousness. And what we're going to find here when we look at King Saul is his worship of God was in, in an idolatrous way. God was a good luck charm. The Ark of the Covenant was a good luck charm. We are idol factories. Human beings are idol factories. We generate them. We want something to help us get what we want. We are convinced that we know best what we want, what is good for us, and if we can just get the control in idols, whether they're little statues, whether the idol happens to be money, retirement plans, that relationship that you want, whatever idol is in your mind, you're convinced that your life will not be complete without it. That's what you need. And essentially, your idol is just a way to get it. It's a, a worship of the self. So I'm going to give a, a little bit of background to how do we get here to the kings. And we'll start, I'm going to start with Abraham. So Abraham is called out of idol worship. His parents worshipped idols. God speaks to him. The drama here, maybe someday we'll come back to that. We have Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob and his sons go down to Egypt. There are essentially 70 men that go down to Egypt. How long did they stay in Egypt? 400 years, I think 430 technically. They come out of Egypt, there are 603,000. Now they come into the promised land, or they go around the promised land. They try to go into the promised land, but what happens? They say they're giants in the land. We can't go in. Another fascinating story. We're not going to spend time on it now. So they wander in the wilderness for... 40 years. So they send 40 years in the wilderness. And then they're going to go into the promised land. And who's going to lead them into the promised land? Joshua. Who's been with them since they came out of Egypt? Good. Moses, since they came out of Egypt. And now Joshua is going to lead them into Israel. They start the conquest of Israel, and essentially they conquer the central, I'll call it the central conquest. And you can read about this in the book of Joshua, and I hope that you will go back and read, uh, read Joshua and understand more about the, the conquest and how they, how they did this. Some tough reading. So I, I would suggest... There, there are versions of the Bible that are easier to read that make it a little bit easier. There are also a lot of lists. Maybe their first time through, you may not want to read all of the lists. 
the list of the sons of this person or that person. Now, it's interesting. It's interesting to me. I've read it enough times that I find the lists fairly interesting because I find people in there that I see from other areas, and we're going to be talking about some of that today. Because who who came from which family actually turns out to be interesting. Maybe some of you have figured out, you know, who are my ancestors? Well, most of your life, it probably doesn't matter. But at some point in your life, you think, you know, that is important to me now. Where did I come from? So when we look at people, and we may look at people like Samuel, even like David, we want to trace their genealogy to see who they came from. It's important for a couple of reasons. We want to know, obviously, who the what family, what line the Messiah is going to come from. That's, that's something very important to us. But also the generational blessings that are stored up for you in your lineage can be very impressive. My lineage, I come from the tribe of Levi or Levi, it was called. That's Why would that be important? Well, the Levites and the priests were supposed to connect the people to God. We're going to be talking about that some and how that goes wrong. Well, what am I doing? Helping people connect to God and help God connect to his people. So knowing the genealogies are helpful. So we get the central conquest, and then Essentially, we get to the judges. The people are supposed to continue to conquer the land. They're supposed to continue to conquer the land. The central area here, the central area has been conquered, but we didn't conquer the plains, the most fertile area, the lowlands. Pretty much they conquered the mountain area and some of this part in the south. So Joshua retires to Ephraim. He's an Ephraimite. Uh, in each of the tribes, you see Benjamin here, Judah here, the tribe of Dan, as we discussed last week. They didn't like this land. They came to, to this area. They said there's no report, no record of them ever even trying to conquer it. Not even a battle appears to have been fought. They just looked at the Philistines. They had iron chariots. And they said, we're going to go find some weaker people to conquer. Now, the problem is that God told them that that was their inheritance. It's not just a piece of land. Today, if we find a piece of land that we don't like, we don't buy it. But if God gives you an inheritance, says this is your land... He means for you to conquer it. And you look at it and you say, that's too big for me, too expensive for me. Uh, whatever, whatever might be holding you back. When you decide not to conquer your promised land because the cost is too high, it costs you your whole spiritual life you will never achieve the destiny that God intended for you. The question is, what should Dan have done? I love to ask this question. We see, wow, that, it doesn't appear that they should have gone all the way up here and conquered a weak and quiet and unsuspecting people who were living peaceably. Those weren't people that God wanted conquered. He wanted these people, these idol-worshipping people, out. It doesn't appear they ever asked God for, their, for his help. It doesn't appear there was a prayer meeting. It doesn't appear that they got together even with, with the elders and said, some of the other tribes, would you, would you help us? They didn't go to, to where the Ark of the Covenant was in Shiloh and pray for God's direction. What we see with idolatry is it's all centers on you. And when you run out of strength, you logically figure out some other place to go, something else to do that sounds good to you. 
And on the way up there, you recall, they stopped by uh, Micah's house in Ephraim, in the hill country of Ephraim, and they picked up his household idols. They basically stole some idols from him. They also took his Levite priest with them. They came over here. They actually went by Shiloh, the Ark of the Covenant, didn't want to stop and check in there because they had their idols and they went on up here and conquered the city. So the period of the judges is a difficult, difficult period. If we do what is convenient for us and don't and it's basically assume God is not going to help us. That, that's really going to damage our relationship with God. You can always come back, but you basically have to come back and start where you were. Basically, you got some land to conquer. And maybe in your life, it's a relationship. Maybe it's some problem you don't think God has helped, can help you with because so far he hasn't helped you. Maybe it's something you, you're so, it's so big, you, you don't, even, don't even know how to pray about it, but you've never actually asked for help for, from other people. Sometimes when we have an inheritance, one of the main things that God can do in our lives is develop one of the most valuable character qualities that you can develop. It's called humility. It's called humility. To be able to say, I need some help. And proud people don't like to humble themselves. They like to become bullies. They like to find someone else that they can conquer, someone else they can judge, someone else they can steal from. Instead of humbling themselves, Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for their, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I've heard a lot of discussions about what it means to be poor in spirit. I would say the number one thing it means is to be humble. But when I think about someone who's poor in spirit, well, let's talk about someone who is poor in health. What do they need? Health. Someone who's poor in money. What do they need? They, they need some money. Someone who's poor in spirit is looking for the riches in the spiritual realm. They're looking in the spirit for spiritual riches. And one of the evidences of spiritual richness is true humility. Not false humility. Not self-deprecation, true humility, meekness, knowing your strength, but not having to show it, not having to flash it around, and are under control. under control, and our example is Jesus. You show us a miracle, we'll believe in you. Could have shown a miracle. I, I probably would have. That, would have. that would have been my cue to say, well, let me show you who I really am. He had no need to prove himself. He was looking for humble people who would notice that would resonate with his spirit and say, this man I want to follow. I'm going to give you a pause. Or I'm going to give you a one-minute pause. And I just want you to think now about is there an area that you believe God has given for your inheritance that you have not been able to conquer, to take, to receive yet? We also talked about humility. We talked about idolatry, anything that might be causing you to turn away. Maybe the television, maybe the videos, maybe your phone. Any addiction is, by definition, an idol. 
The brain wants dopamine. It wants more stimulation. And if you can't put it down, you have to have it every day. In fact, if you don't have it, you start to twitch a bit. And that's most of us. I take a Sabbath every week, shut my electronics off, and I can tell you every week it's difficult. Just want to check that a little bit. Maybe someone needs me. Oh, maybe something important. I'm always justifying. Our brains are so brilliant at trying to justify our idolatry. That's why it's so subtle. That's why God says, have no other gods before me. What I'm hoping in this class is that we will develop a hunger for the word of God. That you now will be reading the word of God with anticipation, the same way you are your TV show, your reality show, whatever your thing is that you have got to have every day or every week, you really look forward to it. You are going to so look forward to reading the word of God because he's giving you insights. He's giving you revelation of who he is. The reason many of us are so quickly turned aside is we don't really know who God is. We don't understand why he does what he does. We don't know him. Since we don't know him, we don't really obey him. Or sort of. Kind of like Micah with his idols. He obeyed him, you know, uses his name once in a while. If you don't obey him, you can't actually love him. It's a step. Obedience is a very interesting step from knowing God to loving God or from loving God to trusting God. If you skip the obedience bit, it's all up here and it never transforms your life and it's never going to work for you except to be really interesting theology. And it is interesting, but I know there's more. So I'm going to give you a minute now just of silence. I just want you to think to yourself, make some notes. If you want to whisper to each other, you can do that, but we're going to keep it quiet now. A question. Sir. You used the word conquer. What do you mean by that? The word conquer. I'm not sure when I use So, oh, conquer your inheritance. If Have you received your inheritance, basically? I'm, I'm, I'm making analogies from the conquest what God intended for the tribe of Dan, not only the tribe of Dan, but all of the tribes, to, to conquer all of their land. Most of them did not. Most of them did not because there was opposition. Is there opposition in your life that you have not been able to conquer? Is God saying to you, you're released from that, that's no longer your assignment, you can go somewhere else? Or is he saying, I'd like to help you conquer that. I'm going to give you the wisdom and the power, and I'm going to help you even pray for it so you can pray effectively and conquer that area of your life. We are more than conquerors, Paul calls us. So we are conquerors, and we are meant to conquer. We are meant to overcome. Okay, minute of silence. <laughs> 